Hello, and welcome to this week's SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group Biweekly Sync. It is May 23rd, 2019. Thank you all for joining us here on the recording, and uh, or here in the meeting, as well as folks watching the recording uh, at home, or your office, or wherever you might watch the recordings. Our agenda for this week, uh, we'll have our quick recap, uh, our, our SharePoint Framework update will be a quick recap on the latest from SPC, so very excited to see that. Some really cool stuff got announced. Um, and looking forward uh, to, to getting that out there for everybody to be using. Um, and then our patterns and practices program updates for the PMPJS, the CLI, the reusable controls, and then as well the Yeoman generator. And then two great demos today from Ijaz and Raman, uh, the first being retrieving and presenting uh, reports using graph data, and the second being material UI components in SharePoint framework. So that's uh, going to be also a very cool demo, and I think – uh, possibly one uh, we haven't seen before in terms of the material UI stuff, or at least I'm not remembering having seen that before. So excited to see both of those demos later on the call. Uh, as always, we do like to mention uh, we're not using Microsoft Teams, not because we don't want to, but because it uh, doesn't quite yet support uh, some of the meeting features we need uh, in terms of running this meeting the way we've been running it and allowing folks from the community to participate and do the demos. So we will switch over just as soon as we can. I know we get questions on that just about every week, so we drop the slide in here. Uh, we will absolutely move over just as soon as we can because I assure you uh, we would all like to move as well. But uh, for now, uh, we will be using Skype, uh, and we will let everybody know just as soon as we can move. Often we get asked, how do I get more involved or how do I participate in the Patterns and Practices program? And there's, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of great ways to do that. The first, uh, my, the way I really encourage everybody is if you have a demo you'd like to do uh, on the call, so this might be uh, something SPFX related, might be something uh, from the PNP family of uh, libraries related, uh, or both used together. Uh, we've seen some really cool demos uh, that way as well. But demo, 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 demo. Uh, Get in touch with myself or VESA. We'll get you on a call. It might not be like the immediate next call because we do sometimes uh, have them booked out, but we will get you on a call. We'll get you a spot. I'm really excited to see those demos. The, the stuff uh, the folks out there in the community are building uh, is really exciting to see, and I know I learn a little bit uh, each time I see those demos, so really excited for that. Um, and those demos can really be just about anything SPFX uh, at PNP related and we'll love to see it. As well, you can always contribute on GitHub. Great ways to contribute are if you find issues in any of our uh, uh, libraries or controls or, or whatnot, Yeoman Generator, uh, please report those. That's the first step in getting them fixed. So if you find a problem and it's, it's frustrating you, don't just sit and be frustrated. Please let us know. Uh, we would like to get that fixed um, you know, as soon as we can or as soon as time permits. As well, if you find something and you have a little bit of time and would like to help fix it, you can always submit pull requests. We welcome pull requests from everybody out there uh, across all of the libraries. So uh, happy, uh, or sorry, I rather I encourage you to do submit pull requests if you have a little bit of time. Um, you know, that's always very much appreciated because it gets things uh, maybe fixed or adds new features a little bit faster uh, than necessarily waiting on the core team folks uh, to get there. And then uh, lastly, if you have a few minutes uh, and just scan through the issues list and maybe you see an issue you've run into before or you happen to know the answer for, uh, just drop in and answer that. A great quick way to contribute and give back a little bit to the community, uh, and it really helps uh, unblock you know, somebody that might have had an issue maybe you've already solved or you've already seen and just pass on that knowledge is a really great way uh, as well to contribute. And then finally, you can always provide feedback. We are always receptive to feedback from everybody in the community. So how are these calls going? Um, what kind of documentation needs do you have? Uh, where, where, where can we help? What can we do to help? Uh, and as well, I always like to say positive feedback is okay, too. Uh, we will do our best to, uh, you know, update things or change things based on that feedback, but uh, change isn't always a rapid process, so don't get discouraged if you give us some feedback and you don't see immediate changes. It's not necessarily because we didn't uh, value that feedback. It's because sometimes it just, uh, you know, takes time to move a ship. So with that said, pass things over to Vesa for our SharePoint framework update and the latest uh, from SPC. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, obviously, we'll 
going to talk about a lot of the stuff, uh, announcements in SBC in the upcoming course as well, and do live demos and those things. Uh, we do have a two community demos today, so I'm not going to spend too much time on here. But I'm, I'm going to do a quick demo and then talk about the updates on the roadmap, so the official updates on the roadmap site as well, uh, which we talked uh, in SBC. And, and like I said, on the upcoming course, we'll definitely go through more detailed live demos on the on the capabilities as we move along on this journey on improving the, the developer platform in SharePoint Online. Now, SharePoint DevDocs, uh, AKMS SP DevDocs, SharePoint Dev Videos, AKMS SP Dev Videos, also the recordings will be there. Uh, this one will be there recorded. The recording will be there in 24 hours. Uh, SharePoint Dev Issues uh, there as well. Uh, it's a good location for reporting any of the issues, which you can actually find in the API surface. Now, a uh, few updates uh, on the SharePoint framework usage. And this is kind of a classic slide which I keep on updating every single week. This is including Monday and Tuesday from this week. Uh, and uh, you can actually see that the growth rates uh, are still skyrocketing. Uh, it is pretty much 45 degree uh, vertical right now going up uh, on the usage per user. Um, and that's um, actually unheard of. So we've never seen similar kind of adaption curve uh, with anything within the cloud uh, in the Office 365 or Microsoft 365 side. So the growth is just unheard of. We can't really right now even predict uh, what are the numbers within a few months because um, at least personally I'm a Finn so I'm kind of a realistic or pessimistic on this thing so I'm just waiting when the curve will at least slow down but it doesn't. It's just amazing. Um, right now we're two or three years uh, from the announcement of SharePoint framework and sure it started slowly and then it started growing and now it's skyrocketing uh, so we're still doing 373% uh, year over three year growth. Now many of you actually in SPC as well people are asking like okay so what's the metric what are we looking here um, and this is something which we can't I, I, I'm not going to explain too detailed we do have a certain let's say it's not a highly scientific but quite scientific uh, metric which we measure the usage of all of our extensibility platforms in Office 365. So CSAM APIs, REST API, Graph API, Office Add-ins, SharePoint Add-ins, and SharePoint Framework. Um, and that metric uh, details is quite difficult to understand. So that's why we don't actually ex disclose the exact numbers, because it wouldn't mean a thing for you. Uh, but sure, so seeing this in visual uh, presentation, and you can see the adoption growth, uh, you can actually see how well uh, SharePoint Framework is being adapted. And SharePoint Framework is by far the number one extensibility model uh, in the Office 365 or in Microsoft 365. Uh, moving on to things uh, or quick dates on the roadmap slide. So this one was the one updated roadmap slide which we used um, on Tuesday in the SharePoint uh, in the Dev keynote. Uh, quickly just updating uh, one step at a time. Uh, this basically, we're going to do live demos on this in the upcoming calls as well. But these are the main topics which we are currently working on. So first of all, uh, moving into monthly or let's say a more rapid, but we're planning to go to monthly, a release cycle with SharePoint Framework. So the idea here is that you will know when there will be a new version available. So don't have to worry about is it coming next week, week after or when. There will be always a version on the second Tuesday of every single month. That's actually our target. So the next uh, time the, the 1.9 version would be coming out is within three weeks. Uh, and then we'll move into this monthly cycle, hopefully directly from there. Uh, which should help on everybody to understand when there will be new new versions available. We'll also work on the Teams integration improvements, like the private tabs uh, support is coming up. Uh, that was announced, we well, talked about yesterday in the in the Teams and SPFX solution uh, in SPC. Uh, general availability of library components is coming with the next release of SharePoint Framework, so that should be there in 1.9, or I can pretty much promise that to be there in 1.9, uh, whenever that's coming out in the June timeframe. Office add-ins uh, with SharePoint Framework. Uh, we did actually do a live demo on this one uh, two weeks ago in this community call at kind of a sneak preview. We're looking into making that to preview status uh, quite soon. It might be in 1.9, it might be on the next one again, slightly depending on the, on the internal resourcing and in our availability. But that's really the beauty of this monthly release is, is that if something is missing the window for deployment for that particular month, it's gonna be out the next month. So everybody will know uh, exactly when the following releases release will coming out. So that should help on everybody on the planning. Content security policy, uh, CSP, uh, this is really a technology which browsers uh, are supporting uh, to be able to limit the visibility or 
to be able to say, add, provide you additional security on not downloading any random JavaScript file from non-supported domains. So this one will give you additional set of uh, supportability uh, in the uh, in the browser and in the cloud world. Then we have CSAM.NET standard uh, being worked on actively. Uh, I would estimate uh, weeks rather than many, many months. Uh, the weeks can turn into smaller number of months, but uh, it's, it's definitely coming out. And we're looking into also open sourcing the Yeoman generator out of the box one, which will then also mean that we're looking into what does it mean for the PMP uh, Yeoman generator? Will we keep them still separate? Or do we actually merge them together as a one single set of Yeoman generator tooling, which you can take advantage? On top of the mind, additional content uh, extensions for modern pages. So the, the, we will definitely have options to overwrite functionalities in the in the UI. So basically, are able to do classic. You don't need to do. Well, obviously, we do not support custom master pages in modern, but you're able to achieve similar capabilities by overriding, let's say, navigation or top header or some other settings on the page um, and embedding your own extensibility over there. Fluid Framework is something which was announced uh, in Build. I'm going to do actually a really quick demo on that one uh, in my computer right now after this line. Uh, but basically, because the SharePoint framework is using the industry standard, we can integrate and use any framework as easy as possible. And Fluid Framework is something which is in internal uh, development still in Microsoft, but it's a really cool way of actually building documents and storing data using kind of fragments of components uh, or document components. And then that gives a near real time uh, editing capabilities within those documents as well. So, and I'll show you that one in a rough demo uh, in a second as well. Throttling updates, and uh, that's there's updates over there, uh, mainly guidance, uh, but there's an API change is coming there as well, which should help you on dealing with the throttling developer tool improvements for SPFX, um, which is a good thing as well. We are kind of maturing the SPFX, so now we start polishing that up, making sure that it's more mature, making sure that uh, any kind of a challenges in the dev tooling are going to be polished out uh, in the SPFX. Black version conflicts or version conf confusion and all of that stuff uh, is, is in our target for that one. And then the store story for SPFX solution. We do know that this has been in our agenda for quite a long time. It's a complex topic because the, we do have, well, we're uh, we're combining quite a few stores currently in Microsoft, and now we're going to make the right decision uh, with the store story for SharePoint framework so that the, you don't have to then move your extensibility or your offering from one store to another. So that is definitely in progress, but we have also dependencies on other teams, and hopefully we can get this sorted out uh, within months uh, or so. So uh, then you can actually finally, as an independent developer, you can offer your web parts uh, through store for anybody to take advantage. And I think that's really cool, and definitely we'll have more details on that one when we get everything sorted out. Good. Uh, now, um, I'm going to do a quick demo on the Fluid Framework, on SharePoint Framework web parts. Nothing traumatic, but I'll quickly show you um, that the Fluid Framework, which was introduced uh, in the uh, uh, build uh, two weeks ago in uh, Seattle, is already internally absolutely available in the SharePoint Framework. And we're looking into what does this mean in practice uh, for us. But let me share my screen. This is a quick demo on using SharePoint Framework to host a Fluid Framework components, uh, which are document fragments or document, document components inside of the SharePoint Online. And so this one, uh, you can see actually two different browser windows uh, in this uh, screen. And in Las Vegas, Las Vegas, we are using two different identities, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, you can actually understand what I'm doing here. When, I, when we are editing something, you can actually see near real-time editing uh, between the, the the windows and between the, the sessions and between the identities. So basically, Fluid Framework is really around the fact that we can expose set of fragments of the documents, for example, in SharePoint Framework or in Microsoft Teams, and that fragment is automatically connected to the original source. And that means that I can actually see any edits what is being done uh, on the other side immediately when the editing is being committed. Now that in this time I'm actually using a table, so that's why you don't actually see any writing in real time, uh, but it's actually basically possible to see the writing coming up real time on the window as well. What's really cool about the, the, the this upcoming capabilities also is that these all of these um, these uh, rows and color cells and everything else are independent cells. So I can actually operate this with this um, uh, component and I can sort and I can adjust and I can modify this based on whatever settings in here. 
but um, the, the connectivity to the origin of source still remains. So it's able to actually detect uh, what is the identity of the original field, and you can actually see the edits uh, getting reflected on different levels. So if I now go to this number 10, you can see that it's a number 10 in there, or if I go to this 78 on the right side, you can see that it's a 78 on the left side, which is the lower level uh, column, because we're sorting based on that column section. Now, if I actually adjust this to be sorted again on the on the same level as in the right side, you can actually see that the fields are on the right order, and we're able to see the live edits uh, in both sides uh, in the in the areas as well. So basically, fragments of the documents being able to, which are dynamically connected to the original source, um, and getting uh, all of the edits and modifications are getting dynamically and immediately, almost in real time, reflected on the other side of the other side of the world potentially, or wherever the fragment is being presented. Is it a SharePoint Online, or is it at Microsoft Teams, like presented in the uh, in the in the Microsoft Build a few weeks back? It doesn't really matter. Uh, it gives the dynamic connectivity to the original data, and uh, the connectivity remains uh, regardless uh, where the component has been placed. But that's a quick demo uh, around the Fluid and SharePoint framework working together as a preview capability. Uh, obviously, this is not yet coming out. The Fluid was announced in build two weeks back, so it's going to take some time to actually get it in preview, uh, but SharePoint framework is 100% ready to be used as the hosting mechanism for these functionalities as well. Really cool stuff. So we're using the Fluid Framework, which again was announced in the Microsoft Build two weeks ago for doing real lifetime edits. And those edits are then available across browsers, cross identities from the document and, and updating on the other people's browsers. So basically uh, editing or modifications of documents or the fractions of documents which are visible uh, in the Microsoft in the SharePoint uh, UI as well. Now, let's actually move into the BMBJS client side library side. I think you have some uh, interesting news in here as well, uh, Patrick. Yes. All right. So I want to give people a little bit of a preview on V2 and what's coming with that. Um, we'll do uh, full demos and things at the uh, European Collaboration Summit next week. And then as well, uh, coming uh, back to this call after the Collab Summit, we'll do some more in-depth demoing. But did want to give people uh, a little bit of a heads up of what's coming and uh, let you know a little bit uh, as well on how to get involved. So there's going to be some structural changes in V2. Uh, we're only going to end up exposing uh, interfaces and factories out of the library. Uh, that uh, will have maybe some impact on you, depending on how you use the library, but the uh, the fluent nature of the library will remain unchanged. So if you were using the library and saying like sp.web.lists and so forth, that will remain unchanged and your code uh, will not have to change. As well, uh, we're going to have uh, this, we're introducing this concept of selective imports. Uh, one of the big challenges we've had uh, over uh, whatever the years now is as the library has grown and as we've added more capabilities, uh, and this is going to sound dumb, but the, uh, you know, library size has, has also grown, meaning your package size at the end of the day grows. So even if you just use one method on web, you end up with the entire uh, PNPJS package being added into your project, which can lead to some very large uh, package sizes for what turns out to be very simple functionality. So we're going to give everybody the, the ability to uh, selectively import just the pieces you need. So you can import just the webs and lists, if that's all you need, or just webs, perhaps, or uh, just the pieces you need. And we'll have lots of details on that coming. Uh, but it really is going to give folks a great amount of power to uh, import just what they need. And then we're also going to have documentation on using that technique to create your own bundles that can then be reused as uh, SPFX libraries, for example, um, and things like that. So uh, we'll have a lot of documentation there. But again, uh, giving some power to folks uh, to be able to import just the things they need, meaning we can continue to grow the functionality with less worry about uh, you know, the eventual total file size uh, that we're generating. Uh, and then this release is going to be a lot about paying off our technical debt. So all methods and properties at the end of this, uh, when we go live with V2, are going to have at least one test. And then all methods and properties are going to be documented. So we have a lot of stuff that isn't explicitly documented. Um, we're going to fix that. Um, and as well, we're going to have more samples in the documentation. 
And then moving forward, we're going to have a couple of new rules that all PRs have to update associated docs and tests, uh, maybe adding tests if there's new functionality and so forth. And then any PR that fixes an issue needs to also add a test to ensure that issue is resolved and we catch it if it comes up again in the future. All of this is uh, as a result of the incredible growth we've seen uh, with PMPJS. The number of people coming in to use it uh, has really grown, and that's fantastic. And so I think uh, it's appropriate now for us to sort of take a step back from adding lots of new features and sort of re-baseline where we're at in terms of our documentation and really make it easier for people to uh, to really just show up to the project, understand you know, how to get started, how to use the library with better documentation and better tests to ensure that uh, the library stays more stable moving forward because, uh, again, looking at how much usage we have and the size of that number, we now have a little bit more responsibility on the uh, library side to really, uh, really deliver, not that we haven't been delivering a great product, but an even better product and an easier to use product, which comes with, I think, all that documentation. So our motto for V2 is going to be users first. So uh, the idea being that documentation, the tests, and so forth really give users of the library the best experience. Um, and then finally, I wanted to mention uh, that the uh, if you want to help, uh, and we need lots of help, obviously, if we're going to document all these things and write all these tests, uh, we would love uh, some help with that. So please check out the README. There's a new branch, dev-v2, in the uh, PNPJS repository. In that README, it outlines how to get started. Um, and we've got David uh, Warner, Julie Turner, and Simon Egan, who will also be helping out with some of the management and tasking of that stuff. But check out that README. If you have questions, let us know. Um, and if you'd like to help, we'd love to have your help. And again, if you're going to be at Collaboration Summit next week, we'll have demos on a lot of the stuff uh, I mentioned here. For now, the existing 1.0 documentation is there at pnp.github.io slash pnpjs. Uh, you can follow the hashtag PMPJS on Twitter, and uh, you can always follow me on Twitter at mediocre bowler. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, I'm pretty quiet, so uh, you won't get a ton of noise uh, out of me. So excited to introduce the V2 stuff. Excited to start demoing that and get that out there for folks. And uh, I think it's going to be a really great release, uh, and that will probably be targeted for mid uh, summer. So we will uh, we'll see there. So, updates now on the Office 365 CLI. There's a new release out, 1.21, uh, 1.21. It's got new commands for updating settings of Microsoft Teams, deleting site content types, listing users from specific groups or teams, cloning Microsoft Teams, and then also uh, you can now update or, sorry, upgrade your SharePoint framework projects to 1.8.2. So that's a really exciting capability. If you haven't uh, used the CLI before, it's a great uh, tool to have in your tool bag. Uh, the, uh, I've said it before, the upgrading uh, your SharePoint, SharePoint framework projects capability alone makes it worth having uh, for, your, for your work. But as well, all the other commands uh, make it a super simple tool uh, to use cross-platform uh, for managing uh, your SharePoint environment. So check it out uh, as well. You can always get the first preview of V2 that's got simplified login capabilities. That's at PNP slash Office 365 CLI at two. We'll give you, uh, that is a beta. Uh, so don't consider that uh, quote unquote production ready, but uh, do please check that out. And then uh, would love to have uh, you know, feedback there uh, for this project. So you can always install the latest beta from NPM. Uh, and then uh, more information at aka.ms slash o365cli. You can follow the hashtag office365cli on Twitter. And there's a Gitter channel as well for questions around the CLI. Moving on to reusable component updates. So two slides on this. There's been so much work we've had to break apart uh, the two sets of controls. And what do I mean by the two sets of controls? The uh, first set of controls are property pane controls. So these are controls you would use uh, in the edit pane of your web parts that really uh, have great capabilities around picking dates and times, picking users, picking um, taxonomy terms, um, and, and other capabilities like that. So got, uh, and I'm not going to read each of these things, but got a whole set of enhancements, fixes, and big thanks to the contributors, uh, Alex and Ward, uh, from this, uh, the, the contributors for this release. There's been lots of other contributors, uh, 
in addition to those two folks. But for this release, those are the two contributors, uh, along with Elio. And this is release 1.15 of the property pane controls. So definitely check those out. It's a great way uh, to jumpstart your SharePoint framework development with uh, some uh, controls that are styled with the Office UI fabric. So they really uh, will blend right in with your, uh, you know, out-of-the-box experience. They'll look like they're part of SharePoint, um, and they'll really make your applications pop uh, with just uh, a little bit of work on your part by just reusing these controls. And as well, same statements apply to the React controls. These, uh, sorry, I should, I didn't mention the property paint controls are React-based, uh, as well are the body controls, or the re reusable React controls, and they... Uh, are, are just like the property pane controls for the edit pane, these are more for the body of your web parts or it could be used in an application uh, customizer or, or wherever. But uh, again, I won't read all these, but great enhancements and then lots of fixes uh, to some things. This is release 113-2. Thanks to um, uh, Thomas, Roberts, and Alex uh, for contributing uh, on this release. Again, lots of other folks have contributed. These are the ones uh, for this release. Uh, and then, uh, really, uh, really cool. And then I've said it before, a great way to jumpstart, uh, you know, your projects and get some great functionality without having to write it yourself. Um, and these, the React controls and the property pane controls are as well, uh, a great, uh, great way, uh, to kind of, if you want to start contributing, uh, it's a great way to get involved because each control is fairly, uh, atomic and isolated. And if you want to write a control, it's not quite maybe as daunting um, as some of the things. So get in there, uh, contribute on the controls, or contribute on, across any of the projects uh, is very much always appreciated. And uh, finally, we'll mention the PNP SPFX Community Yeoman Generator. So this is a Yeoman Generator built on top of the out-of-the-box SharePoint Framework Generator, which allows you uh, to create uh, just regular old SharePoint framework project. So under the hood, you're getting all the same out-of-the-box libraries and functionality and dependencies, but you have the additional uh, capabilities to have a little bit more control over uh, creating your solution. You have some additional choices in the menus, and you can add uh, a lot of things you can't add in the out-of-the-box uh Yeoman generator, such as Angular, Vue, um, and things like that. So as well, you can always add stuff like jQuery, PMPJS, the reusable controls we talked about, uh, the CLI to your project, things like that. Uh, it really makes it easy to create your SharePoint framework projects, um, and it's really an enhanced uh, kind of experience there. And this is something uh, Vesa was talking about earlier. Uh, the out-of-the-box one uh, may be open-sourced, so we will see uh, what the relationship of these things uh, is going forward. Uh, that's still uh, TBD, but uh, for now, please check this out. New release 1.8, one, uh, and then uh, you can always install that with npm install-g at pnp slash generator dash spfx. For more information, check out the links there and the hashtag pnp spfx on Twitter. Moving then into the demos. Uh, Jazz, are you ready to go? I'm ready. Great. Now, if you want to take over. Okay. Um, so, uh, so first of all, um, to start with, hi, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Ijaz Hussain, and today I will be presenting a SPFX web part, which dynamically uh, generate Office 365 reports using Graph API. And, hats, uh, and after that, the data we get, we, we have some uh, integration with uh, Chart.js. So uh, to start with, before I jump into my uh, the next slide, uh, let me jump uh, show you the, what the web part look like, and then we can talk about what's actually the component, what are the components in the web part. Okay, so that's uh, a web part. Uh, SPFX web part, which has um, uh, Office 365 reports of. Uh, uh, for three different areas, uh, SharePoint, uh, uh, OneDrive, and Outlook. So if we talk about the SharePoint, um, uh, the first one is, let's suppose we have a SharePoint site usage reports. So uh, so this is a bar chart. So it basically, by default, is loading with uh, seven days. If you, if you click on 30 days or 90 days, is to retrieve dynamically, basically retrieve the data and re-render that chart. And uh, if you, um, so I mean, uh, it's worth noting one more thing here. Basically, I've also used uh, 
uh, material UI here for, for th this tab menu here. Uh, and also a few, a few other components which I've used in there for, from the React Material UI. So if I go and let's suppose I want to pull up the SharePoint activity and you see uh, for um, uh, 30 days and 90 days and then, um, you know, vice versa. So you have some reports coming from the SharePoint point of view. So I have like a more than, uh, in, in this tab, I have a more than one uh, charts displaying. So this one is showing uh, total number of total Act, total and active sites in my tenant. Um, so yeah, you can have uh, different dynamic options there. And if we go to OneDrive, so again, same uh, uh, different reports related to OneDrive. And if we go to, I think this is really, really cool. So you can basically click on these ones and you can uh, hide those one and just see which one, which information you are interested in. So that's really cool here. And um, so if you go to Outlook, uh, again, this is like a, one of the other uh, uh, reports which are available, uh, um, uh, which is email activity by uh, user detail, and you can see how many emails sent, received, and read. So, um, yeah, so that's, that is uh, my, uh, the web part, and if we now talk about what's actually in that web part and what are the components, uh, let me go back to my slide, and... Okay, so we have so what in web part components there are about uh, four uh, four different uh, types of uh, different uh, uh, scenarios which I think uh, uh, is, is worth mentioning. Number one, uh, tabs UI you you saw uh, coming from Material UI React, uh, and uh, um, if you talk about uh, Microsoft Graph API integration, now uh, so I'm going to show you the code afterwards as well. Well, uh, so my Microsoft Graph integration, uh, I have used a uh, dependency injection pattern. Uh, uh, I'm going to show you in a minute. Uh, uh, Ward has written really, really nice posts about uh, dependency injection pattern. Uh, I'll probably must show you if, uh, let me just go to the code to show at the same time. So, uh, so that's basically uh, the graph uh, uh, dependency injection pattern. So. If you are looking to uh, have, uh, if you have your multiple web part consuming Graph API, uh, I think this is the best approach. Uh, you, your different web parts uh, can consume centrally available Graph service. So um, yeah, the course are, uh, the, this repo is available, so you can check. Uh, all you have to do is basically uh, uh, create a, a service scope, and then you have those endpoints which I've used, for example, for the uh, SharePoint usage reports, so you have that endpoint uh, is being used, so you can see which endpoint has been used. Now, and it's worth mentioning here, I've used the better, better version of the reports because uh, the, the, the better version basically provides you a, 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 a ability to uh, tell what, what type of data, in which format of data do you want to retrieve the data, so, uh, uh, and I I, I don't think so is available in the other, uh, which is the uh, broad one. So I've, I wanted to get in JSON format, so you basically can specify which type of, of format uh, of the data you want. Uh, 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 so that, that's really, really powerful and cool. So you can check basically how uh, these have been done here. And, and um, so, yeah, so that's that. And then um, Graph API permission, um, Graph API permission to retrieve Office specific user reports, so we need reports.read.all uh, uh, permissions, uh, and um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, nice uh, um, uh, tutorials out there. Uh, I've, I've gone to the slide with reference, so you can check, uh, and then the chart implementation based on user reports, which I use the chart JS library. So let me go back to the code and show you all this in action. Uh, so the, the, that's the graph service we will talk about. And if I um, go into one of the component, which is say get SharePoint site use the reports. Uh, so what I'm getting here is I'm getting the I'm uh, I'm I'm getting um, uh, this instance of my uh, service here uh, in this component, 
and then and then after that i'm i'm calling my default um, uh, service to get the data based on my period with default it's 7 uh, 7 days so once i've got the data uh, i've got uh, this ma this is where basically uh, the chart.js uh, uh, i'm preparing all my labels and uh, the object for the chart data and other char other chart options and when it's done uh, i've got this let's suppose i bar component now this is the one thing i want to mention here because i've used another library so initially i was looking to use a, a reusable um, re reusable chart control from pnp and what i've couldn't find one of the option because when dynamically i've received dynamically uh, dynamically low data and I, i'm going to click on 30 days and 90 days i wanted to redraw my chart so i couldn't find that redraw option in that uh, uh, pnp reusable control i might need to look more or probably find that so why i've I've done that. Uh, I end up use another library, React Chart JS, which basically is a wrapper for uh, Chart Chart JS, and which has a really really nice uh, uh, one of the option, which is a redraw. So every time I click uh, in the different reports, like in 90 days or 30 days, is basically I basically automatically redraw with my latest data so that's a really key thing basically if you have a dynamic different option uh, and you want to reproduce the data as well that needs to look into it and and if I and I've got all components here SharePoint reports Outlook reports and OneDrive reports um, and, and if I uh, show you my uh, manifest file uh, no sorry config to see if we could see the permissions uh, uh, sorry package solution oh yeah there you go so uh, so this is the permissions you need reports uh, dot read dot all and here is the link working with office 365 views reports in Microsoft so here are all the endpoints you can see for the reports uh, available under the Microsoft graph API that's all uh, from me guys Great stuff. Thank you for that. Um, there might be a couple of questions for you there in the uh, chat window. And I think now uh, we can switch over to Raman. But thank you very much, Jazz. Uh, really great demo. Awesome to see that. Uh, some really cool capabilities there. Um, and that is uh, right published uh, in the, the repo for samples, I think. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Perfect. Um, so we'll get the link to that associated with this call, and then uh, Raman, if you're there. Hello. Yep. Hi. Great. Uh, I think uh, if you want to go ahead and take over, I think uh, yeah, sure. you're up. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Ramin Ahmadi. I'm a senior SharePoint developer at Content and Code, and today I'm going to show you how you can use React Material UI components in SharePoint Framework. Um, as you know, uh, uh, before SharePoint Framework 2.8, uh, it wasn't possible to use uh, React Material UI because it's, uh, it's um, requires the minimum version of TypeScript 2.8, and now uh, in favor of SharePoint Framework uh, 1.8, we can use TypeScript 2.8 and above, and also it supports uh, Node 10. That is really cool that we can uh, have more features to use uh, as a developer and uh, for using Material UI, uh, first we need to update the human generator to use SharePoint Framework uh, 1.8 and also uh, install TypeScript compiler that should be 2.8 and above. And if you're using SharePoint Framework uh, 1.8.2, you don't need to be worried about that because it's uh, set to TypeScript 2.9 as default. And after that, you need to install Material UI components that you need and also the types for the TypeScript. And then you can uh, import and use the components. So uh, let's jump to the uh, web part. So here's really a basic, uh, basic web part to uh, show you how you can use the uh, Material components. I use uh, some of the components like text field, uh, uh, icon and the table component that has uh, pagination uh, functionality that 
I, I really wish that I, uh, we could have it in uh, Fabric UI and also um, uh, the dialog component uh, that you can see here. And also I uh, used one of the um, RxJS operator called Debounce time. Uh, basically, this operator is popular in scenarios uh, such as uh, type ahead where the rate of uh, user input must be controlled. For example, uh, if I start uh, typing, it uh, it waits for three milliseconds before it uh, send a query to the server to get the data. Uh, as you can see here. Uh, and if I want to show you the code. Uh, so here are the packages that are used for this uh, web part. So I added material UI component libraries from uh, like like here, and also PMPJS for uh, getting the data from uh, SharePoint, and also I installed RxJS to use uh, a debounce time operator. Uh, for those who don't know about the RxJS, it's uh, for reactive programming. That's uh, if you are interested in uh, reactive programming, you can um, basically. I, I recommend you uh, reading this uh, uh, article that is really uh, uh, cool about uh, reactive programming and how you can use it in your code. Um, and also about the components. Uh, I have uh, details uh, dialog component, pagination, and also uh, the table component that is uh, coming from uh, here. Uh, as you can see, uh, I have the table component uh, with all the headers and also uh, the content. And also, I use the PMPJS to get the data from uh, SharePoint. And here, I set up the RxJS debounce time, so I give it three milliseconds. Uh, so when you start typing, it just uh, waits for uh, some amount of time, so you, you're uh, to make sure that you uh, done with typing and uh, send it a uh, query to the server to get the data. Uh, and I think. Yeah, here's a, it's just a simple sample to uh, show you how you can use material UI components. And as you, uh, you've seen that uh, Ijaz also used uh, some of the components from material UI in his demo previously. So uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you very much uh, for that. We'll return to the slides real quick. And I think you might have a couple of questions there in the <coughs> IM window. But another great demo, so thank you uh, very, very much for that. Um, and again, I always like to mention, if you would like to do a demo on this call, please, whoever you might be, just get in touch with us, uh, either myself or Vesa, and we will get you signed up uh, for an upcoming call. So <clears throat> our next SPFX uh, JavaScript meeting will be June 6th, and then the next general SharePoint development SIG will be on May 30th. Um, learn, reuse, and share. and we might have taken, oh, we do. We have a little bit of time for Q&A. Um, so if anybody has some Qs, we might have some As. In Angular fully be integrated with SharePoint framework, is it a good idea or should we restrict ourselves to Angular elements? Um, yes, yeah, both of them, no. Um, the Angular really isn't designed for a, a model where we have multiple different components uh, at the same page, the original Angular, and Angular Elements is basically designed to address that. Uh, I don't know how many of you actually been involved in this course for quite a long time, but we actually, in real life, we did have quite a few meetings with Google Angular team, where we wanted to make sure that they can easily integrate and they can provide Angular, which works uh, properly within the SharePoint framework for enterprise customers as well. Now, the Angular elements is definitely the way to go if you're using an Angular, um, but then you will need to uh, remember that if you use Angular, uh, there will not be reusable uh, UI controls uh, using the Fabric uh, or the, the BMP SPFX reusable controls, which is a pity. Um, and obviously, we would definitely welcome Angular-based controls from the community as well. But um, right now, those do not exist, and there's nobody leading that effort. Let's see. Let's see. 
Good question. Can we create a custom column uh, in SPFX? So you can overwrite presentation of a field in SPFX. You will not create a custom columns or custom fields in SPFX for SharePoint. That is not supported. But if you're looking into overriding presentation of a existing field, uh, that can be actually done using SharePoint framework. Can we recommend and use the preview actions in production environment, power apps, push notification actions, convert file. Um, so Ravi has a kind of a general question related on preview capabilities and can those be used uh, in production environment? Um, potentially yes, but then it is in your own risk. The, the preview basically means that the, the, the feature group or the feature or organization owning that capability is uh, is uh, uh, basically calling out that we might still change this, so that might have complications for you sooner or later. Now, if you're prepared to fix whatever you're running into, then it's fine. Uh, it's just a matter of making that decision that you are aware that it's in a preview capability what you're using. So, uh, but again, and also worth mentioning, they could change uh, yeah. unexpectedly. Okay, so, if, okay. if you're relying on a preview capability for a production app, it could simply break at some point. Yeah. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. Praveen actually was asking this earlier in the call as well. I think we need to touch this. Definitely, what is the best uh, approach to develop an application using SharePoint Online and AWS SQL Server? Um, I'm not a specialist in AWS, uh, but I, my understanding is that you can build uh, AWS uh, kind of a web APIs and extensive APIs there. And then you would basically use those APIs to get access on the data in AWS SQL Server. Now. Uh, I do not know how the identi identity flows in AWS. Uh, I do not know if you can securely call an API in AWS. So one alternative option, you know, which which is also an option for on-premises data, get get presented in the in the SharePoint Online. If you really want to align on the Microsoft design here, you would be able to replicate the relevant data for AWS SQL Server to Azure SQL Server and then present only the relevant data from from there. Again. Is that an option for you? I don't know. Uh, but it's the same story with uh, on-premises LLB systems. Um, you probably don't want to call from a SharePoint uh, framework to Azure and then do a pipeline to on-premises network. Rather replicate the data to Azure SQL, uh, which is then only the relevant data, not for example confidential data, and present that out using the SharePoint framework uh, web parts. Much better approach, and that will have a positive impact on the performance as well. Um, unfortunately, like I'm, at least personally, I have I haven't tested out AWS SQL Server. I don't know how to get access on that data directly from SharePoint Online. Can we have audience target the SPFX web part? Uh, HS is asking that. So the audience targeting uh, for more out of the box web parts is now kind of a slowly rolling out uh, across different web parts. But unfortunately, it's not really audience targeting on a visibility of the web part. It is audience targeting inside of the web part, and um, it is in the pipeline or in the roadmap uh, to support uh, third-party access and capabilities for the audience targeting. Uh, but it's not yet available. So it's not really something which we support right now, unfortunately. So the right way of implementing anything which would be profile based is really to have a code uh, piece in your code. You would be then using accessing user data from Azure or user profile and say, oh, this person is from London. So let's actually show this information for this person because the pro user profile probably is saying that he's from London. Now, this person is from New York. So web part will adjust on the content based on the user profile properties. So definitely a doable thing. And and more well right now, the best way of solving those personalization scenarios in SharePoint framework. And Bu Bu is answering thank you uh, on the AWS call as well. Uh create a custom column which displays preview of a tile icon so that you can use select tile icons. You could actually do that preview uh, preview of a custom column in a list or a field, and you can definitely take advantage of SharePoint Framework field formatters to actually make that kind of functionality available. Now, is it completely matching what you're doing? I don't know. Uh, it gets to the technical details again, but have a look on the field customizer. This is enough for Navi Neath uh, around the approach, which might be suitable for you. 
are there plans to add beta level command extensions? Uh, answer from Hugo. Answer is yes, and there is. Um, unfortunately, some of the, that's one of the stuff which has been pending for quite a long time. The idea would be that in the modern page where we have created a new page or the new button in the top area of the page, you would be able to add additional patterns there. Um, and definitely in the roadmap, I know that uh, Dave Cohen, who owns this uh, section and this area, is looking into making that happen as well. Dave should be, by the way, Hugo, you're still in Las Vegas because you have that at SPC19 on your name. So Dave is, my understanding is Dave is still here. Dave Cohen would be the person to hunt down today in Vegas and start asking about that question. So. How to get search results in a .NET web application from online, SharePoint using modern authentication. Uh, I think we actually have just C some REST APIs and, and uh, C some APIs and REST APIs for search. The authentication doesn't really change that as long as you authenticate uh, from a external application using app only. Uh, well, the app only impacts the, this one though, because then it's not a user permission restricted result. Hmm. Praveen is asking, is the API a secured one? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, if Boo has actually had a look on this, this I would use Amazon API Gateway, AWS Lambda, or Auth the secure API. So you can actually make that happen in AWS. I would, I'm not that surprised. It is a good platform as well. Then, uh, since classic basis and views still exist in modern sites, do we need to provide a dual solution, especially SPF extension, to get the custom feature on both classic and modern? Also, would classic page site pages completely take out? We're not dropping the, the support for classic pages and classic sites uh, because we can't, uh, but we are investing only on modern. Uh, the reason why we can't is quite simple uh, people are still using them, and until people are actually reducing the usage uh, to a certain level, we definitely cannot actually reduce the support for classic uh, capabilities. So it is, though, in our interests um, to actually make sure that people are using modern and in the consistent way. So there are plans um, to hide, for example, move classic capabilities or doing options for there. So making sure that the end user cannot actually accidentally fall on the classic experience. Um, but I'm not quite, I can't update where we are precisely on that, uh, that uh, right now. Um, if you're new SPFX, where should you start your journey from? Um, uh, from cash, uh, and now I'm going to add here a AKMS link, which is definitely the right uh, way to SPFX uh, training. This is awesome training material, which is available for anybody who's looking into getting started with SharePoint Framework. Um, and then it actually covers different scenarios um, up to the level of accessing craft APIs and securely call web APIs in, in Azure and really, really great uh, stuff, um, and really high quality material as well, videos, presentations, uh, hands-on labs, and demo material even, if you want to do that uh, and deliver that to somebody else. Anything what I missed, Patrick? We're running out of time. Uh, InfoPath is supported but deprecated, so yeah. InfoPath is what it is. It's not being worked on. That's answering Stephen's question. And let's see. So you get my client are creating, pay. okay, that's a real complicated thing. We're not going to get into doing a consulting engagement on the call. And uh, I think we are good. It is top of the hour. Thank you all very much for joining the call. Thank you, uh, Ejaz and Raman, for the great demos today. Thank you, everybody, for being part of this. And uh, look forward to talking to everybody soon. And if you are at Collab Summit next week uh, in Weisbaden, please do uh, look us up. We'd love to meet, uh, you know, Folks in real life is always fun, um, so do look us up. Uh, we've all got sessions across the entire PNP uh, core team and uh, would love to see you out there. So have a great week, and uh, we'll talk to you all soon. Bye. Thank you, Thank you all. Thank you, Ramin and Ajaz. Bye.